Oh, greetings, everyone. I'm Fern Malice, and I'm a very proud member of the FIT Foundation Board. And I'm very um, happy to welcome you all to the FIT Entrepreneurship Series. This is a series which is organized into engaging virtual panels that focus on important topics for the FIT community, including female entrepreneurs, clarifying your brand, minority-owned businesses, unconventional career paths, and today's subject, aligning social justice and business. And to talk about that today, you're gonna to meet two very special people. First, we have Monica Prone Savant and Doug Hand. They are partners in a very unique business called Equal Hands, and they are also partners in life as they recently got engaged. So congratulations. Thank you, Fern. Thank you. It's very exciting. I'm jealous of all the beautiful pictures of you guys together everywhere on Instagram. So follow, follow Doug and, and Monica, and you could follow their romance as well as their business. Um, but first, a little bit about these two accomplished overachievers philanthropists and social activists. Monica is from Laos and was living there with her family in the 70s during a secret war that killed many families. Her family sought asylum in Argentina where she grew up in a refugee camp. She was abandoned by her mom at age six and was raised kind of by her dad. But Monica learned to survive on the streets doing every chore imaginable to gather food to eat and she sold souvenirs handmade by local artisans. She dropped out of school at 15, somehow got to, got, and somehow eventually got to New York and a job in the fashion industry. Thanks to her constant optimism and dreams of a better life. She's with us today and will shortly tell us about creating her business, Equal Hands. But let's also first meet her business partner, and life partner, my friend, Doug Hand. He is one of the preeminent fashion lawyers in the country, and he is the most stylish, best dressed lawyer you'll ever meet. And he's my lawyer as well. I always tell young designers starting out in business, get a solid financial partner and a good lawyer and do it at the beginning before you make costly mistakes. He is a founding member of the law firm, Hand, Baldachin and Associates. And some of his clients include Stella McCartney, 3.1 Philip Lim, Anna Sui Public School, Zedigan Voltaire, Zoltaire, and many, many more. Doug is featured and quoted in every major publication from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Women's Wear Daily, Business of Fashion, and a million more. Doug is also the author of two books, The Law and Business of Fashion, and Re The Law of Business of Fashion and Retail, and the Laws of Style. And he hosts the podcast, The Laws of Style, which is also on YouTube. Is that correct? It is on YouTube as well. Okay, great. He's a board member of the Fashion Group International, Business Advisory Committee, and other committees of the CFDA, adjunct professor of fashion law at both NYU and Cardoza School of Law. He's on the advisory board of Goodwill, New York, New Jersey. And most importantly, he's a member of the FIT Foundation Board with me. And we're lucky to have him. And there's more, but that's enough to get the idea of how busy he is. So let's get to some questions and learn about the subject at hand and about equal hands. So Monica, will you tell us a little bit? I mean, I gave a little overview of your journey, but tell us a little bit about your journey. And how did your family decide to go to Argentina of all places from Laos? Well, so when my parents were in a refugee camp in Thailand during the war, um, uh, different countries were asking where you wanna go. And my dad raised his hand to go to Argentina because it, he was a farmer. And back in the late 70s, Argentina was a very uh, rich land to go farming. Um, so he thought he, was, he wanted to be a farmer and he ended up in Argentina. So as soon as we got there, we were uh, giving a bag of rice and a space to leave. It was about 100 families. Um, and uh, we're supposed to get support from the local government, but 
we never did. And I just ended up growing up in the camp until I was up to 15. And that's all I knew until I was 15. And then, um, yeah, so that's how my journey started. And that's how my family ended up in Argentina, all because my dad uh, wanted did to- Did you apartment. learn Spanish there? Uh, so I was born there and I went to school when, when I was, uh, yeah, when I was later went to school in Argentina. So at home, we would speak Laotian, which is my family language. And at school, we speak Spanish. And um, at a 15, I dropped out of school and moved to Buenos Aires. And um, that's when I, I started to work in different factories of clothing and shops. And, and all I knew is just sell clothing. And, and I came to America at 17. Um, how did you how did you manage to make that trip? I mean, you had enough money to do that, and enough. Well, yeah, my mom um, left when I was six years old, um, and she just ten years, eleven years later, went to Argentina and said, "Hey, here's a ticket. <laughs> Come to United States if you want to get to know me better." And uh, yeah, so that was a chance for me to reunite with my mother and get to know her better and and start and start a new life somewhere else. So I, I got to come to the U.S. That so was can, are you still close with your mom then in the U.S.? We, we are, we are, we are close, but you know, we're not everyday close. <laughs> we're more like holiday close. <laughs> and your dad, where, is he still alive? Yes, he's in Argentina. And he's, he's still in Argentina. Yes, he's, still, he's definitely not a farmer, <laughs> but he's still in Argentina. <laughs> what does he do down there? Uh, he's a massage therapist. <laughs> That's a change. Yes, yes. And so that's why I see your trips to Argentina on, that you've taken is to go back in this family there. Yes, yes, my family's still there and Douglas and his family got to go there this past year. So it was really, no, two years ago, sorry. We have yes. traveled this year. Okay, and then tell us before you explain Equal Hands, you, you, I read about a trip you made back um, years ago to a monastery in Laos and that that was a very inspirational trip to you. Yeah, so before we uh, move forward to Eco Hands, my, my, my decision based on Eco Hands and the inspiration is because I've always been in the, in the fashion industry. So when I came to New York, um, I landed a job at Fifth Avenue in the luxury house Burberry, something that I never thought I could do, but apparently you can work in retail without a degree. <laughs> so I, as long as you have some skill of selling and, you know, and, and love for products, and that's how I built my career. And I, I've been in the industry and fast forward when I'm 30 something, I'm traveling to Laos to, to kind of reconnect with my family roots and kind of understand where my family come from. And one day I, I went to this monastery, monastery in the middle of nowhere and I only had very little cash on me. And these little, little kids girl were selling souvenirs, uh, specifically beads, uh, bracelet beads. And I purchased one and 10 more kids came to me and be like, buy more, buy more. And I'm sure a lot of people experience this going to different parts of the world. And I was like, I don't have any more money. Like I, I already spent the last money I have in the next ATM. It's like two hours away because I'm like not in the city. And, and they spoke my language. I, I, I'm very fluent in Laos. And literally they said, please buy more because I walk really far and I need to eat today. And to me, that was, it, it really flashed back to who I was as a child. Sorry. <laughs> no, so, that's great. Growing up in Argentina after I was 15, I was also after school doing those things. Like I was selling litter um, dolls needed by my local uh, community, the artisans. And I would go to the street and that doll sale represented my meal for the day. So... I really, although I'm living in the United States, I have built two businesses. I already know how many zeros in a million dollar. You know, like and my life have changed drastically. But that trip and 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 having this little girl talking to me and and saying that those words, it just really made, just it remind me to like how 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 much I have today and how much my life have changed and what are the difference I could have made by just buying one more bracelet, you know. And you know, growing up where you're not, you're, your everyday struggle is very different from the struggle that we are as a today go through as a society. Um, it really, it really hit, hit, hit me. And I, since then, I always thought about 
using my skill set, my skills and what do I know and the connections or whatever that I have that could make someone else life a little bit better. Uh, whether it's just, just buying a meal for the day or not having to walk two hours from the village, you know, for water or can go to just school for like, you know, and not have to skip school and things like that. Um, so I talked to Douglas about, I don't think he remembers this, but uh, and during one trip in Greece, we were having lunch and I told him my dream, this is us, we're getting to know each other. And I tell him like, my dream will be to do this, to, to use everything I know, every knowledge to, to be the bridge of giving back somehow. And this is what I know, I know. And it was just, it went to our kind of back burner, right? We never really talked about it again. But during COVID is when you, you know, COVID happened and then you start thinking about everything, like what's happening with people's lives and how we're, what's important to us and how we need to stop. And it really, I was like, this is the time for me to slow down and, and, and press reset and reinvent myself and, and take the opportunity to actually do what I really love, uh, which is, you know, what I'm doing right now, which is eco hands. So, you know, we combine my, my skills and my expertise in retail and everything I know about product development, branding, marketing, and um, product sourcing to- Oh, you know. so, so Equal Hands started basically, as, it was quite a new company then. It started after COVID, yes. After COVID, okay. But started. so what were you doing immediately before that after selling in Burberry so that you got all that merchandising, marketing, you know, production skills and uh, the, that- that yeah, there's a gap. Yeah, there's an eight years gap. Um, I one day was at Burberry and said, if I work as hard as I work for myself, I'm sure something else will come up. And I started with connecting with all my friends that had like uh, uh, clothing lines. And I started to take the product and selling it in different markets and different uh, events. And and it started from that. And then um, there was an opportunity at the limelight, uh, 2000. It's been a while. <laughs> I'm like. Hey. Remember when the limelight had that huge retail floor print on the on the ground so floor? So like had a booth there, yeah. like selling yeah. Exactly. yeah. Yeah. So I had an opportunity to open a little kiosk there, and it was literally less than a hundred square feet kiosk, and I was representing those designers and friends that I knew, and we were doing so well that we expanded. We got to know the landlord, and he 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 gave me a lease for like a four thousand square feet, and that's when I opened my first boutique in Manhattan in Chelsea. Um, we took all my knowledge from different experiences in, in retail and opened my first boutique. And what was that called? It was called Modalistas. <laughs> it was just very a Spanish name. <laughs> it was very like to my roots. Um, it, it means fashion ready. And we were selling mainly ready to wear with emerging designers and brand. And I think at that time firm, I didn't know, I know nothing about sustainability. I knew nothing about where like I know, I know the clothes is made with uh, you know with this particular designer with this particular manufacturer but I didn't know all the problems behind those this, this areas of creating a garment or an accessory of all of that um but after the store uh the limelight have given the lease to a gym and we had to move out so then I went and venture uh, launch a new business which is called Motorbox which is selling the same type of product but in a per personalized shopping service so basically our clients will start a quiz and based on their quiz, we match them with the stylist and the stylist will curate a series of outfits for them to try on in the comfort of their homes. And then from that, they can buy what they like and, and, and return what they didn't like. And with this is more technology driven. It was more data, uh, collecting data from different po points of uh, clients information and matching them with stylists. And Motorbox currently, it's under wrap, <laughs> dealing with a private private equity firm. And then because of that, my time kind of like opened up a little bit more. That's when I- You were I, a serial entrepreneur, just keep rolling and creating new things. Yeah, so, and I-, I Yeah, you're, you're, you're <laughs> not including the, the South Street Seaport store that you had for Motolistas as well. And Fern, I know you know that corridor when they were um, you know doing leases down there. So she right. had a Motolistas, uh, two locations, which, um, I think the pivot to online and the box service was was, that was liberating and so that was smart yeah yeah it was me trying to expand more like the technology side of it um so where did when did you guys meet uh three years ago <laughs> yeah so we met three years ago and um she was deep in in motobox at that point in time and um 
you know, we, we both knew that we were in the fashion industry. We both knew a lot of the same design houses. Um, same but, people. <laughs> same people. But honestly, you know, during COVID and during that period of self-reflection that I think everybody had, um, I'll speak for myself personally, you know, having represented many ready to wear brands and recognizing that the cycle of fashion is one that results in 70% of produced garments winding up in landfills or burned. Um, and that even as just a legal advisor, I say that, you know, I, I'm not, a, but I'm contributing to that in some way. And, um, you know, that, that was painful to, to, to recognize. And, um, that led to me upon that self-reflection, taking a lot of steps, um, including joining the board of Goodwill, because I do feel as does equal hands as part of one of its pillars that, you know, garments have multiple lives. They don't, they don't have one life and they don't have one season. Um, but we'll get into that. Uh, <laughs> so you, so together you decided to create equal hands. Correct. Yes. We, and, and, ooh, sorry about that. Oops. And what it, and the mission for Equal Hands? Um, explain that you know as succinctly if you can. I mean, I know there are three pillars of sustainability: people, planet, and pop progress. Um, is that the basic foundation of it, or is there another catchphrase that would explain Equal Hands? It's 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 if it, it found that based on the three pillars, the based on the three problems that we were, we wanted to solve uh, using our, our channels and our areas of expertise, um, you know, first people we know, and I know firsthand by traveling the world and, and being in those part of the areas and leaving myself that, you know, we, we do survive with less than a dollar or two a day, you know, we're eating rice and salt and, and, and for us in here in, in, in in other countries, it's like less than a cup of coffee. So it's how can we contribute to that particular, you know, in a sense where we're not giving it to somebody, we're buying something. Um, and then planet is, is what Douglas explained early, earlier. It's understanding how the, how the garments are made and, and thrown away or how we, we're using garments as a disposable product now and day. And there's so many damage to the planet. Um, you know, and, and, and progress is, is back again to a full circle of helping people and helping them understand that they do have talent and with that talent, they can rise by giving, empowering them and saying, hey, I'm not gonna buy this car from you and, and give you the fish tonight. I'm gonna try to teach you how to fish. And by doing that is, you know, helping you a little bit better in understanding that you, you, you have a lot of talent and people will pay a lot of money for the scarf that you needed and it took you a year. And, you know, a lot of people, a lot of artisans don't know that. They don't know the value of, of how luxurious can be handmade product. So during this year of COVID, when nobody could travel or go anywhere, I mean, you've assembled collections of clothing and accessories from all over the world. I mean, how, how in God's name did, do you do that? I mean, I, it's, I, I mean, and it's nice. I trip into <laughs> South America right before COVID. Yeah. Um, and we did perhaps ill-advised, but you know, we came back and we were clean. We did, we have a lot of artisans uh, in Morocco. Uh, and so we did get a trip into Morocco um, this past New Year to to visit, you know, some of some of our production partners. And um, you know, the the business plan is to visit many, many more of them much more often um, because it is one thing to be speaking and and emailing and communicating with your your production partners and have them represent to you that yes, you know, I I'm a grandmother and my two daughters and me and my sister, we are the factory, mm -hmm. but you need to be there and confirm that. It's, it's, it's not as simple as just that representation and a couple of photos that they've taken. Um, when you go in there, your website, I mean, there, there are many, many countries listed for um, collections and things. I mean, I mean, it's like, I mean, it's like, thank you. You could take a trip without having to get on a plane. <laughs> yeah. All of these things that you would buy if you were there. Yes, we bring you the story to you. We bring you the different countries. Um, and the, the the business idea was already uh, seeded for years ago. We just happened to launch in a time that we we it was like if we don't do it to the, now, when would we ever do it, right? So because it was seeded 
way before uh, we decided to launch the business, the relationships were already built. Um, so when I went to Southeast Asia, I already had met like different villagers and artisans and people that I knew I wanted to work with. Um, in Colombia, I made a couple of trips to Colombia years ago that I already, and some of the designers I already worked with on, in my own boutique, um, you know, they already share that same mission. And so the relationships were already built. Um, gotcha. in Her before. fluency in Spanish. Laotian, <laughs> Thai, I mean, and, and my fumbling French has served us pretty well. Fantastic. Yeah, okay. it's amazing how far you can go by speaking Spanish, uh, especially with all the, the partners we have in, in, in Latin America. That's so also social justice is a big part of this um, issue and subject today. Um, Doug, can you clarify what social justice means? You know, I think the the progress pillar speaks to that obviously people you know social justice relates to people but we want to create an environment where our makers our artisans um, rise above having just a relationship with us and i will say having dealt with brands my entire legal career and recognizing the power that a brand communicates to the consumer and what the consumer will pay in addition to what the, the raw value of the good is, is something that to many artisans is a complete mystery. They just, it's, it's, they, they feel that that is beyond them. And it is absolutely not. You know, I think the consumer is hungry to, to have a relationship with the actual maker as opposed to a brand, which is siphoned through and filtered through a whole PR and advertising mechanism designed to make them just love that vision, that storyline of whatever the brand espouses. These are the real makers that we're dealing with. We yeah, want that, that's luxury. That's the luxury business if you know the maker and can connect with it. Exactly. Exactly. And you know, that doesn't just reside in France and Italy, right? Because the great luxury houses that we know of that have been around for hundreds of years, that's where they're from, right? Um, but there is no reason that a great house couldn't rise from South America or Africa or Southeast Asia. And we would, it's, it's beyond us to make that happen. But all I'm saying is part of our mission statement is to make sure that not only the, are the artisans being paid more than just a, what is a fair wage in terms of, you know, what it takes for them to put a roof over their heads and feed themselves. Um, but to educate them that this isn't the only model through which you and your works can get to consumers. And if you can bridge the gap that is us as a retail platform and do it yourself, you could have a very viable business in, you know, whatever segment it is, you've, you've seen equal hands and I'm sure we'll cut to some of the product placements without it looking like advertising. But you know, we cover health and wellness, we cover accessories uh, and we cover apparel. And um, the artisans that we work with are excellent in those channels, but you know, a lot of their sales are through us. That's great. And you'd say that all of the products on the site are ethically produced. What does that mean? Well, we, we can, I can. You I mean, use in the code of conduct. <laughs> you know, so, so we have a code of conduct that we make all of our production partners sign off on, um, which certifies to the extent they will certify, but again, we wanna be boots on the ground to also visually inspect uh, that there are no human rights violations going on, that everyone is paid at least a fair wage, that in terms of environmental representations, that from an ecological perspective, the goods are produced in a way that is recognizing um, not just the product itself, but the packaging and any of the waste related to the product is dealt with in as planet friendly a process as possible. We also really avoid types of products that you know, are known to be high waste products, um, high use of water, um, use of toxic dyes, um, because we just, those aren't consistent with the way that, uh, that we want to put products out there. So by signing that contract, we're all hoping that they are staying legit to that. And eventually you will 
monitor that more in person as you can. You know, to the extent we've been able to, we've monitored it um, and we've we've let them know. I mean, you know, part of the problem, I'm not going to geek out on the law here, but part of the problem with fashion in terms of regulation is fashion is global and a regulatory regime and scheme is 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 local with respect to the country that you're in. And so you're also dealing with language issues. You know, we've been translating those contracts into various different languages because it's, you know, you, I know brands that will send out a code of conduct to, you know, and, and, and it'll get signed. And I know that, that <laughs> yeah, the people that it. signed Nobody's it read it. And what it was. So, you know, that's important as well. It can't yeah. just be, here's some boilerplate, sign off on it. And then you've got, you know, your hands over your eyes, your hands over your ears, your hands, you know, and, and, and that's the process. What We're not in it for that because candidly, Fern, we don't, you know, I, I would be more thrilled if we helped three brands emerge from our artisans. This is not a money, you know, this is not going to become a billion dollar brand, nor do we want it to. That's hey, not, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, but that's not the MO. The MO is for it to become something that sustains itself economically so that we can perhaps pay ourselves something, but I mean, candidly, travel. you know, pay, pay, you know, the, the people that work closely with us, but ultimately, you know, we have other jobs and, you know, we have other sources of income. This just feels very right. And um, well, that's important. You know, it is important. And through a process known as, as B Corp certification. Yeah. Tell uh, us about what B Corp means. And well, so a B Corp stands for a benefit corporation, and there is a certification process that, uh, that you undertake uh, if you want to become a B Corporation. That allows the legal entity to have a mission statement that is not maximization of shareholder wealth. And so notable B Corps would be Tom Shoes, uh, Patagonia, uh, Eileen Fisher. And um, the process is rigorous. You know, you, you actually take a test which has hundreds of questions, if not a thousand, and, and you're scored on it. And those questions range from how do you dispose of waste, you know, in, in your headquarters to what is your supply chain diligence? Yeah. Um, and Packaging, uh, how do you use your electricity? How do you, everything. All of it. And and to, to going back to ethical part, like Fern, we're, um, the brand, the brand that we, the, the partners and vendors and brand and artisans that we work with, we carefully curated them. We didn't just like, Anybody can just come to us and be like, we want to be part of Eco Hands. We go through the process of learning about them before we onboard them. So that process alone already, like we like, do they fit this criteria? Are they using organic fiber? Are they using natural uh, dye? Are they using uh, all kinds of natural, like we, a lot of our products are made of a up 100% cotton hem or straw or palm tree or, so we use very little hardware, even in the product. Mm -hmm. and our clothing are not mass, mass produced neither. They're like um, made to order. So all those all those process comes before we even onboard them. Gotcha. The part of it, making sure they fit that criteria. So you've applied for the B status, right? So you didn't yeah, so the process is you, you submit an application and then you, if you pass that process, which we have, you are a B Corp pending organization. Um, and then you are assigned a, a specific examiner who works with you throughout, you know, the course of the next year to, to get the B Corp status. And then you have to continue to, to practice what you preach right. to maintain the status. Um, and we're, we encourage it. I mean, again, not to geek out on the legal side of this, but I do think that disclosure is very important for consumers. And, yeah, and, and transparency, people want to know. Yeah. Um, one of the other brand promises is to give back to charities. Uh, which charities do you support? Can you? So we partner up with a platform that has already about 50 different charity and we have chosen three. Um, one is to help educate uh, little girls in India. The other one is to help uh, mothers in Burma to give birth. And the other one is uh, stop human trafficking. Um, we, it's funny because the platform is called, it's called EcoHand, no Eco. Okay, sorry, I'm blanking out. But um, Eco Change, I'm sorry. Eco Change. Eco Change. So <laughs> the platform's called Eco Change, and they are they what they do is they um, source all the different uh, nonprofit organizations, and by using the platform, customers get to donate 
uh, for every purchase they make, but the money comes from our company. So when you go and make a purchase, you choose where you want to donate, but the donation comes from us. Great. Um, the products that it says on your site that you sell are from all over the globe, but not from the US. Why? Is there nothing in the US, no craftspeople or people creating ethical products here? They don't need as much help. <laughs> We do have, uh, when COVID happened, we created uh, a set of masks and headbands by, um, with a local interest. Uh, he's, a, he's from Philippines, but he, uh, we use scrap fabrics, upcycle up fabric to do the mask and the headband. Um, so that's one of, was one of the product in the U.S. I think, you know. I think we also view our upcycled collection as of a U.S. Exactly, origin. Exactly. Like, you know, yeah. we, we've partnered with Goodwill to essentially select from good what goodwill offers not on a preferential basis you know i mean because it would be a conflict for me to get first dibs on on goodwill donations i just went to the store <laughs> just go to the store and and upcycle it and you know have worked with the designers you know with monica and with interns that we have uh one of one of whom was from fit and incredibly talented to to create unique pieces out of out of gently loved older pieces well we both worked on the goodwill benefit virtually and and saw what beautiful things you know greg lauren and and um tracy reese and um, yoli put together from the goodwill stores uh, mm -hmm. it was very impressive um do you both see more acceptance of fashion brands pivoting to sustainable business practices and do you see consumers responding to that or wanting that or asking for that <laughs> I, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll answer that because I represent many of them. Um, I do, but it can be difficult if you're a brand that has been around and to date you haven't really been exhibiting any, you know, in the way that say a Stella McCartney has always, right? You know what Stella's brand stands for. You know what Eileen Fisher stands for. You know what Patagonia stands for. It becomes a little disingenuous for brand and I won't name any X, Y, Z, right? It has a 30 year history of production. Uh, you know, some of it takes place in India, some of it takes place in Bangladesh. And, you know, those are some of the hot spots in terms of, of human rights violations in factories that all of a sudden is espousing uh, that, uh, you know- that They care for the planet and the world and yeah. Yeah, but do I think that, um, that brands are taking it seriously? Yes, they are because I think the consumer finally is. For, for years, you would have consumer data that would say, yes, I care about where things are manufactured, but then you'd have the actual data of purchases and you'd see how Zara is doing and H&M are doing, and you'd realize ultimately when it comes down to it, people don't care. Um, that is changing. Well, and caring and, and um, LVMH seem to be making strides, you know, out for 10 years and 20 year goals to really, um, do all of that. And it's not only just in the clothing, like you say, it's changing the electric bulbs in the factories and, right. you know, the, the, how things are shipped and the packaging and all of that. It's, it's a, it's a very, it's a much bigger subject than just having some good, you know, clothing that's uh, recyclable or, you know, made from a certain fiber and, you know, so it, there's a lot to still learn, but I think if we learned anything through this COVID, you know, we see, how much damage we've all done to the planet when you saw, you know, transportation stop and airline stop and shipping stopped and you saw, you know, fish in the canals in Venice and, you know, blue skies in China and India. Um, you know, we're responsible for screwing up this planet a lot. Yeah. So, and the fashion government. industry is the second biggest polluter after the oil industry. It's it's shocking to many to hear that, but it's absolutely true. But so it, how is it, how is Equal Hands doing? Are you pleased with your progress right now to date? I, I'm. We're very we're very pleased. We're matter of fact, we have. Um, I don't want to say the name yet, but we even have like a big department store and from friends reach out to us already to wanted to carry some of the product and the upcoming stores they're opening in Qatar in Japan. So and obviously you know the the consume the beginning consumers that we have. I mean I I feel. I would say for I have three businesses. 
in my past life and this life. And I think this is one of the best rewarding business that I have built so far. So, and we have received orders from all over the world, which is also that's, that's fantastic. It, it, it has us in knots in terms of shipping, but we-, we Yeah, I don't even want to ask there. you about how you fulfill the orders from all these places. Yeah. That's, a whole other, that's a whole other FIT <laughs> subject for, the, for them to explore. Um, Doug, can I just ask you quickly, you know, like how, how COVID has impacted most of your clients with their businesses? You know, there was, look, we were at a, a retail uh, trough even before COVID. We both know that. Barney's went down before COVID. And then <clears throat> you had other wholesale accounts going down. And so most of the brands, most of the larger brands that we know and we speak of have a tremendous amount of wholesale risk, which for those that maybe don't understand what that means, that is selling to a department store who perhaps pays a portion of what that order is and pays the rest at the end after they've sold it all. Well, when those brands, when those stores had to close and couldn't sell anything. They couldn't pay anybody. But the brands that I worked with all had orders that they had to either try to cancel, much to the detriment of the factory workers there who, who then wouldn't get paid, um, or absorb and then hold on to this inventory. Some, have, some have, have had to go under, some of the brands that I've worked with. Many have held on. And I think just to speak to our, our self-reflection during this period, I think the whole industry has had a, a serious period of looking at itself and saying, you know what, I don't need this roller coaster ride of four seasons or eight seasons, mm -hmm. right? I don't need to show. I know what my core product is and I want to make that better mm -hmm. and make things that, you know, are adjacent to that from time to time. But, you know, when... When you know that your, I don't know, your, your camel duffel coat sells really, really well, don't stop making your camel duffel coat. And in fact, you know, I've had brands who say, we want a program where that duffel coat, you can always, once you buy one, you will own that one forever. You can bring it back and we will repair it, or we will give you a new one and we will take that one. And we have a whole vintage line where we sell just in the same way Rolex tries to do, or Tiffany tries to do to control just you know, the, the complete sale of their product. And I think that is a much more viable future for brands and for the planet because we don't need to always be making new stuff. A lot of the stuff that we make is really, really strong and, you know, and can last. And a lot of people realized in a year they didn't need to wear a lot of their stuff. I mean, they you know, <laughs> looked at these closets and I, I mean, I, I, I'm guilty of still not cleaning out the closet enough because I mean, I've worn the same 20 things and 20s being, you know, a largest number there, maybe the same 10 things for the last 10 months, you know, it's, it's crazy, you know, and um, we all, I think it's been a big learning curve for everybody um, during this COVID. Uh, but, I, you know, I, I sit on a retail um, call like every few weeks with a whole group of people and everybody's very optimistic about fourth quarter. Uh, you know, they're trying to figure out their inventories. They said all stores are, people are lining up outside stores and malls and cities all over the country. There's a pent up demand for people to want to buy something now that they can get out. You know, people who have been vaccinated and want to join the world again. And, you know, and people are looking at that roaring 20s coming back next year with, you know, maybe galas and parties and gowns. Uh, I don't know. I think it's going to happen for it. I mean, I, we're, we're all ready to bust out. People, many people are sitting on a lot of money because they haven't traveled and they've been eating at home and, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of money out there. I mean, which is crazy because, I mean, at the same time, there's still people on food lines who yeah. can't afford and so many people who've been let go and unemployed. So that 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 range is still so, it's more 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 diverse and more focused than ever. You know, it's, that's, I think, the look scary. at other countries, particularly countries that produce a lot of the items that we're talking about. In many ways, they've been the hardest hit because when the factories stop, yeah. that worker who depends on that $2 a day mm -hmm. and hasn't received it in 30 days. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so on another, you know, I think we have about a minute left, but um, what's, What's ahead for Equal Hands? 
anything like and something exciting that you want to tell us that's hasn't been an, I mean you I don't know there's some excitement things happening that you can't say but uh, well I think you should it, just stay tuned and yeah we're we we our like our mission is to really empower and help as many individuals and artisans and and talented people um so I think that these opportunities so if there's any creative artisans out there they could get in touch with you instead of going to Etsy Yes. <laughs> yes, they can. I mean, our, our channels are open for everybody. We obviously like uh, make we the artisan needs to meet our standard of our our you know our, the way we 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 have everything in terms of conduct and all. But uh, yeah, we are always meet, open to meet more artists and artisans. And and I think as as things open up, one of our goals is to better show the actual maker, the actual artisan, whether that's through the site or, you know, through other literature, but, you know, a site can be a pretty dynamic thing these days. And, um, you know, we want to get footage of, of makers making yeah. uh, and, and, and showing that because I think, I think the consumer is, is hungry for that. And I also think it's great for people to see not through that lens of, of marketing and PR and a brand, but actually see the face and the hand sure. at work and see the skill involved. So everybody watching should go to www.equalhands.com and get the whole story and see all the, the products and figure and, and start yeah. buying them. Yes. So, and, an and, what's, <laughs> and what's next for Monica and Doug? When are you getting married? <laughs> you did it already? Uh, no, 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 no. Not yet. Yeah. No, I mean it's been difficult to, you know, we we were planning on Thailand, but it's very difficult to to arrange for, and I think there will be a real backlog of people getting married who were engaged before the <laughs> pandemic. So yeah, I've heard that wedding venues are booked for the next three years. Yeah. I mean, people are going crazy. I think we will surreptitiously do the legal thing, um, and then we will have a party in a year in a year and a half, but just mark your calendar, Fern, and Thailand and, you know. That'll be a good excuse to go to Thailand, that's for sure. Exactly, no, it's, it's the, the wedding is supposed to be a minor, you know, part of it. You're supposed to plan two weeks and come spend two days with us and then the other <laughs> 12, you know, you enjoying a beautiful country. Yeah. And, and are you gonna wear a dress that's made by an artisan? Probably, <laughs> if it's not, it's, yeah, an upcycle or something, yeah. I mean, and what designer will you wear, Doug? An upcycle as uh, well. <laughs> well, an upcycle, but probably Greg Lauren. <laughs> okay. And we also, we will request, I guess, not to buy anything new, <laughs> to wear something they already own or something they borrow or something that's an upcycle. <laughs> okay, so there's something borrowed, something blue takes on a whole new meaning now. Indeed. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you both. And, uh, you know, best of luck in... In business yeah. and in life, and uh, and good luck with all, all of the this exciting new new venture and company. Let's yeah. all help save the planet and save the people, and and uh, onward and upward. And thank you all for tuning in. Thank you. Great Bye. to see you. Bye. <laughs>